I think that in almost every respect, um, the palbosic lip and, and the ribosic lip, and you can look at the molecular structure, which is very similar. They are probably doing the same. I mean, there's one difference, which I believe is unfortunate, that in the, in the Mona Lisa trial, the, the issue of QTC prolongation popped up, which has led to a little bit differential um, regulatory rules uh, about ECG and uh, to be done at the start of the treatment in, in many environments. But any other than that, I think both in terms of efficacy and also in terms of the side effect profile, they are very much the same. So the differences come down to number of tablets to take per day, scheduling, and I'm pretty sure that the marketing departments in either company will dwell on this. <laughs> uh, but I mean, is there any reason theoretically, I mean, a metabolite or anything like that to believe that? I mean, because I agree, Joyce had said this before, the curves look pretty close. I mean, mm. these drugs look very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Is there any theoretical or other reason to believe that a patient who's not responding to, say, palbociclid in an AI would not respond to ribociclid in an AI? No. Honestly, I, I don't think so. I, I think most of us would believe that uh, abemaciclib is, is different. Right, uh, we'll get to that one in a second. Yes, but, yeah. and, but the two others are pretty much uh, similar also in the in the clinical it just really is more in the formulation and the side effect profile etc yes. right. that's yes. it and the pills and how easy it is to dose reduce and things like that may I approach maybe the question again from not the German point of view but we are going to face the same uh, not problem but the same process of this and discussion in Germany now and many other places in Europe having ribocyclib uh, approved since last week in Europe, uh, we are going to have the same discussion now. I would like to see, and I hope that we are going to see, and with this data we might convince more the GBA, this authority which is going to make the payment procedure uh, coming down to the, uh, to the patient. Um, Life quality, they want to see life quality data. Did a patient who were put on ribocyclib compared to the standard arm, did they have less pains, for example? If that is on the chart, if that is going to be proven, then this is more convincing. Having time to progression as an endpoint is fine, and maybe in some of the su subgroups, maybe in the, some of the subgroups, this is also convincing data for the authority, uh, we might be able to show a survival benefit. I don't know, maybe bone only or whatever. And again, coming back to the life quality issue, the GBA was stating, and this is not correct, that CDK4-6 inhibitors have a similar side effect spectrum like chemotherapy, neutropenia. Now, neutropenia yeah. is something you measure from the blood, but asking the patient, did you know that you have neutropenia? And the patient, I don't know, I didn't know that I have neutropenia. If the patient has neutropenic fever, then it's different. So this is the point of convincing, where we have to convince this authority that, but one second, that chemotherapy induced side effects and CDK4-6 uh, side effects are different. Are they completely different? Yes. I completely agree. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe we can, um, beca because this is happening actually in, 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 in cerebral environments. I think we should, uh, maybe it's too provocative, but I, I would <coughs> suggest that we should make a clear statement. Overall survival in luminal breast cancer is not a rational endpoint any longer. True. And there is a simple reason for this, and this is the numerics. As we fortunately are able to treat our patients with multiple line of endocrine targeted interventions plus chemotherapy, uh, maybe if, if, if needed, the, the median over survival of metastatic uh, breast cancer, luminal breast cancer, is now exceeding five years for many, many patients. And even our most spectacular PFS differences are just a small proportion of this, one fifth right. or something like this. And it's highly unlikely, even when we observe a hazard ratio, which we are carried away with 0 0.4, 0 0.3, that this can actually um, translate into significant, statistically significant over survival benefits in every case. So I think while I accept that it is fair that authorities obviously have the job to define value and you know what is the cost of which benefit. I think we should try as, as 
clinician scientists to send this message to say, in this segment of the disease, over survival is not the most rational endpoint any longer. This does not take away the obligation to talk about side effects, which, which I guess we will do in a minute. And, yeah. and clearly, I mean, patients don't know. I can tell you when you start doing this, and you all know this, I mean, you receive frantic calls from husbands, from GPs, putting GCSF into these patients. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a matter of education of our colleagues, of ourselves, and of patients and their families to say, well, yes, Neutropenia, numerical neutropenia is the main side effect of this class of drugs. However, it is mechanistically different from the neutropenia we see after chemotherapy because essentially to these neutrophil precursor cells, the same happens what we hope and know that happens to cancer cells. They are stopped, but they are not damaged and they are available once you stop uh, the, the, the drug to immediately produce uh, uh, and neutropenic fever, as you have mentioned, is an extremely rare uh, uh, observation. I think it was less than 2% in, in all these trials, which right. I think is an important message. To them. And I tell you, using these drugs in the early breast cancer setting in, in clinical trials, uh, that there is a huge communicational effort necessary right. for right. the right. whole right. system, um, that this is a completely different ballpark from chemo-induced neutropenia.